So good afternoon, everybody. We welcome you for this presentation. And uh, uh, this is the work we have been preparing for the last few months with Justin and Anne about the Oroville organization. We started also with Anandi, but unfortunately she had to go, to, to go back to Spain and then uh, we continued the, the three of us. Yes? Oh, yes, please, if you could switch off your phone first so that we are not disturbed. So for this work uh, about the Oroville organization, we did uh, quite a, an in-depth study starting with what the mother had envisioned for our uh, collective organization. And uh, also we studied quite a few other researches which have been done through the years, for the last 20 years in fact. And there were many and many very interesting. And what surprised us is that their conclusions, most of the these researchers pointed to the same thing. So for us, it was more a kind of work for synthesis to try to find out what were the common denominators in these conclusions. We also studied what Shrike Joshi told us when he was here as a chairman of the governing board and international advisory council. And it was very important to us to see what he said because being the main architect of the Oroville Foundation Act, he was really the, the one, the authority, which could uh, tell us what the Residence Assembly was meant to do, the Governing Board and the International Advisory Council. So we'll go through this uh, presentation where we called uh, it Oroville Prosperity because this is where we started with Jocelyn. But soon when we started to work on this idea of Oroville Prosperity, we found out that in Oroville, everything is linked. And to try to solve any issue, uh, you, you need to have a kind of over, overall picture and see how things can move at the same time. So usually, when we speak about organization, it becomes very serious, a little boring. And so instead of presenting our research to the community, we thought that maybe at this time of crisis, it would be better to present it to the mother. So this presentation takes the form of a letter to the mother, and uh, we will go through it. You will see it's a, a bit, uh, it takes about one hour, and it requires some concentration, so uh, we'll go through it. And at the end, we will have for about 45 minutes, one hour of interaction, di discussion, question, answers. If you have ideas or critics, you are all welcome, because this is a, a work which is in progress, and uh, day by day, we just upgrade it to try to make it better before we give it to the community at large. So thank you. So I will not read everything because it will be a bit tedious and it will take too much time. So I will read what is really essential and I will try to summarize the main points within the presentation. But first, this is our letter. Douce mare, sweet mother. We recall so many years ago our overwhelming joy and amazement at your call to come and join the great adventure, where we could build the city of the future, a city that belonged to no one in particular, but belonged to humanity as a whole, and which would become the cradle of a new species and a new world. A divine project inspired by Sri Aurobindo as something else. And we were assured of its success, the help was there. All we were asked to do was to be of goodwill and leave the old world and our old selves behind. Today, in the midst of the global crisis, we begin to see so clearly how nature responded magnificently. Yet we can see now how, in many ways, we have failed you and we have failed ourselves. You clearly gave us the guidelines for the organization of our society through countless conversations, writings, and messages. But what have we done with them? Needless to list here all our shortcomings. You know, as well as we do, the bureaucratic monster we have created. The ideals of peace, unity, truth, and harmony have been too often betrayed, but today we can only see the present crisis as a real opportunity to evolve towards an organization which would fulfill, finally, 
your dream about relationships of emulation in doing well, collaboration, and real brotherhood. This is why we would like to share with you our thoughts about how to revive the true spirit of adventure which brought us here, and how we could really take inspiration for your vision to reorganize our life in a more harmonious, fraternal, and truthful way. And this is how it could look. But first of all, let's remember briefly what your vision was about. So here yeah, I'm not going to read all the, the quotations. There are not many, but still it would take a bit too much time. This is the very beginning of the dream, where the mother says that to live in Auroville, one could live freely as citizen of the world and obey one single authority, that of the supreme truth. In the very first para of the charter, she says, to live in Auroville, one must be a willing servitor of the divine consciousness. And to come to Auroville is not to come to an easy life, but it means to come for a gigantic effort for progress. We started with these three quotes because just to show how I, the mother, has set the bar for Auroville and for us. But she was very practical, and she said, to be practical, you must first have a clear vision of your goal, of where we are going. For us, this is very important, because we feel that in today's organization, it's mostly a kind of confusion which prevails, and uh, we don't really have a very practical goal. We know the charter, we know the dream, but how to, how to move forward practically in that direction. The aims of Auroville, are an effective human unity, peace upon earth. And this is for us kind of polar star, the, the, really the star which can help you, us to move forward and to uh, always remember where we are supposed to go. Then she said in Auroville, nothing belongs to anyone in particular, all is collective property. And then, as she was very uh, interested by the financial question, she said, things are beginning to come for Orville. There are many, many. But there is, above all, the internal financial question. I would like there to be no money within Orville. We would have to work out something. I would like money to be retained only for relations with outside. And finally, this is the last para of the dream. And for us, it was interesting because in this para, she really defined the spirit of what our organization should be. And she said, there should be somewhere upon earth a place where work would not be a way to earn one's living, but a way to express oneself and to develop one's capacities and possibilities while being of service to the community as a whole, which for its own part would provide for each individual's subsistence and sphere of action. A place where human relationships, which are normally based almost exclusively on competition and strife, would be replaced by relationships of emulation in doing well, of collaboration and real brotherhood. So now, out of this vision, how to translate it into our life. So we'll start with your vision in the making. In the light of what we just read and which expressed the essence of your vision for the organization of our life, we saw that the following steps could be taken to ensure that Auroville can sustain herself in the future, something which seems to really make sense today. So the very first thing would be the creation of Auroville prosperity which would provide all the bodily needs in kind. Secondly, unification of all our distribution centers and purchasing services under Portus. Three, development and creation of farms in order to become self-supporting. Four, development and creation of units in order to produce as much as possible our basic needs. Development of the free store Reduction of the use of money and creation of a new system of exchange or prosperity coupons. Creation of a network of outside producers and consumers to locate what we need but cannot produce here. Shift in our organization to create a circular economy. And finally, creation of a unity council and organization of the active residence assembly. 
So of course, we know that all this would take time to achieve, but some simple practical steps could be taken right away to set in motion this new journey. So now we are going to have a look at all these practical steps one at a time. First, Auroville Prosperity. So what was Auroville Prosperity? Auroville Prosperity was a name you gave in 1968 for the service dedicated to provide in kind the essential bodily items needed to live simply, decently, and beautifully in Auroville. It lasted for years and was the main channel of our economy. To be part of the Auroville Prosperity, one had to work for Auroville or to contribute in kind or cash. And you gave the spirit of the Auroville Prosperity through the following message. It is not for comfort and satisfaction of desires that one comes to Auroville. It is for the growth of consciousness and consecration to the truth that has to be realized. Unselfishness is the first need to participate in the creation of Auroville. And earlier also, the mother spoke about this idea of Auroville becoming self-supporting, which didn't mean autonomous, but she said, in Auroville, one does not have to pay for one's food, but one must offer one's work or material. Those who have fields, for example, should give the produce from their fields. Those who have factories should give their products or one's labor in exchange for food. All this in itself eliminates a lot of internal exchange of money. And then she said, that means that people will not need to buy food with money, yet they must earn it. So, the revival of Auroville Prosperity. Today we feel we should revive your idea of Auroville Prosperity as a central piece in our economy, a service aiming at providing in kind the essential bodily needs to each Aurovillian and newcomer working for Auroville, studying or contributing in kind or cash and who wish to participate. We could even develop it further and it would work like a cooperative in its true sense, which means to share and cooperate, and would be the common wealth of all those who participate. That's very important. In this presentation, there is not, nothing really compulsory. This is based on voluntary participation. And this idea of Auroville prosperity would be also based on this. So how would it work? The idea would be to replace the maintenance system, which still allows the circulation of money with the Auroville prosperity. Instead of receiving a maintenance in cash, each Aurovillian who would participate would be registered as an Auroville Prosperity member and would get the following services. Portus items, as it is done today in PTDC, and more. Solar kitchen or other meal schemes, healthcare, non-dini, water, electricity, gas, telephone, and internet, mobility, house maintenance, eco-service, and prosperity coupons that we will see later, and which would be used within Auroville and partly exchangeable with cash. So units and services would provide each month their contribution for those who work for them and who wish to participate to the experience with a minimum amount set for the different cases, students, workers, full-time or part-time workers, and so on. Aurovillians who are not getting maintenance but who have personal means would contribute in kind or cash. Then, to develop even further the functioning of prosperity, collective services like collective laundries, for instance, could be created. Today, we believe it is possible to make it because the wealth is there, the land and the infrastructure are also there, and last but not least, it really seems to make sense. And then we could see it as a, as a game, something we share together and we play together instead of being something too serious. And the spirit of the game would be that there, there would be for the participant no personal property within Auroville, no circulation of money. The aim would be to replace money with an in-kind organization, to build a relationship built on trust and mutual care, to bring about a spirit of real brotherhood, to live simply but decently and beautifully. The prosperity is based on voluntary participation. Each participant decides what he or she truly needs. It's not like in the ashram where in prosperity you get one toothbrush per month, one toothpaste, and so on. You get a certain credit, like in PTDC today, and then you decide what you really need to, to get. 
It is based on conscious consumption and goods exchanges, and it will be the common wealth of all the participants and a familial way of dealing with each other. Second point, unification of our distribution centers and purchasing services under Portus. So first we'll see how Portus was created. As you may recall, Portus was initiated in March 1972 after receiving your original encouragements. But everything started when Claire wrote you the following letter. Mother, if one day Auroville is to function fluently for need and demand without the internal exchange of money, perhaps the time has come to create that proper channel. We could begin in a temporary building and see how things evolve. In an additional note given at the same time, she asks you, Mother, if this is a work to do and money comes in for it, what should be the name of the bank account? In those days, all new ideas were presented to you through Sham Sundar, so also this one. Having read the proposal and follow-up note, Sham Sundar remembered later on that he had never seen you so happy and that you said excitedly while pointing your finger in a tapping motion, this is it, this is it, give me a, a paper and a pen, and then you wrote, for all and for tous. What a beautiful name to start with. It sounded really promising. So, and this is how Portus opened on 28 February 1974 as a channel to facilitate a new kind of moneyless economy and organization. The first service provided was only for food and basic supplies and was organized in a joyous atmosphere. So now, to reorganize Auroville in the light of your vision, we saw that it would make sense to first create a purchasing service for the whole of Auroville, including restaurants, guest houses, and distribution centers. The mission of this facility would be to provide the goods at the best prices available and to choose the item taking into account their price, quality, footprint on the environment, and their impact on health, so that each and every Eurovillian can benefit from its services. Secondly, to reconvert all distribution services to the values of the existing PTDC, with added sections for special items such as organic chicken, fish, goat cheese, and so on. They will be open to all Eurovillians and newcomers and will function at cost price. Three, involve voluntary community participation in the work done by the distribution outlets and the food processing just as in a cooperative to reduce the charges to its minimum, just a few hours every month. Create income generating service outlets which would be open to guests and visitors. These outlets would be operated under Portus. You know that recently we had a vote about the aspiration Portus and finally the, the committee has decided to go for a service. And uh, somehow we found that this is a bit uh, uh, limitative because we still have guests and uh, visitors and so on, so we would also need a commercial uh, unit. And this is what we propose to the FMC and the service trust and we'll see what they think about it. And, but anyway, that would be really something to be done and also it would be possible to create a portus uh, uh, for, the, for the workers, especially dedicated to, to the workers, but we'll see later on why. And five last point, develop food processing services to reduce wastage by using the farms and orchard surplus and provide high quality items such as evening tiffins, curd, cheese, butter, jams and so on, and a research section into new food. Three, development and creation of farms. So, of course, what we have just seen now would really make sense, and the current crisis is showing just how fragile our present organization is, if we could aim at becoming self-supporting in terms of food production. To produce locally as much as possible what we need should therefore be one of our top priority along with securing our water resources. And we know that this is possible. We are having now enough farmlands to produce food for the whole year, for the whole city, and more, even for the villages around us. So to do this, it's just a matter of to take a collective decision and engagement to do it. 
So, but uh, somehow we are quite hopeful about this because we can see now that in Aurovid there are many experiences which are going on, like the, the work which is done by Krishna and others. And this is kind of aiming at this, uh, this possibility. So in order to achieve this food security, we would need to, this is not an exhaustive list, there, there will be, could be more points, but that's the main one. And of course, the very first one should be to increase production on currently active farms. There are many farms in Auroville which produce much, much less than what they could. For instance, Oro Charge have about f more than 40 acres of land, but they cultivate only two acres, which is very little. And it's about the same with Annapurna and others. Second point, develop home, community, and kitchen vegetable garden, just what Krishna is doing. Identify and develop new farmlands. Develop forest farming. Develop new methods like greenhouses, farming, hydroponics. This has started, I look, has just started a hydroponic uh, farm for salads, which is quite, uh, quite nice. Uh, find lands in a more suitable climate. Involve more community participation in farm work for harvesting, for instance. Increase community kitchen. Introduce dinner tiffins. Learn how to use and cook local vegetables and fruits. Learn to identify the wild edible food and increase our food processing capabilities. Some of these points are already developed now in Auroville, like learn to identify the wild edible food with, I think, Nina is doing this and others, other points. So the fourth point, which would be uh, also in the same spirit, development and creation of units and services. Now, we could also extend this effort to our self-sufficiency by developing our factory-made productions. Today, Auroville is already producing quite a large number of essential items like soaps, candles, EM, natural detergents, and so on. So here also, the work has already started, and we just need to progressively increase the diversity of these items. To this end, we would need to identify what could really be worth making here and invest in these new activities. That would be one of the main uh, interests of having one purchasing service for all, uh, besides just to reduce the price, of course. It would be to know exactly what we are consuming, what we need, so that we can eventually planify what we can produce and develop in Auroville. Five, development of the free store. As you know, the free store has been for many years one of our main moneyless service, and it could very well be developed to include household and gardening items, like furniture, electronics, and so on. To this end, a website could be developed to facilitate this service and minimize the needs for a big outlet. As we have seen earlier, the mother said that in Auroville, everything is collective property. And today we can see many uh, Aurovillians which are selling things between them, themselves, and this is something which is a bit new. 30 years ago, nobody would, uh, would do such a thing. And uh, for this, there was much, uh, much, much uh, uh, more obvious uh, spirit of uh, gift economy in our society. So slowly we drifted away from this, and the, this idea to create a website where anybody who has something to give, uh, give away could just put a photo and, and share with the community if anybody wants to, to get uh, this thing. Then, creation of a new system of exchange or prosperity coupons. So as we have seen earlier, your aim was to reduce as much as possible the circulation of money in Auroville. And to achieve this, you conceived two things to organize our economy. The very first one was Auroville prosperity. And then you spoke about the possibility to have a coupon system to give, as you once said, the small extras which give life variety and pleasantness. As we have seen, Auroville Prosperity would give the bodily items what you really need to live, and you could really live with this, but sometimes you need extra. For instance, if you want to learn something, to learn uh, to play an instrument, and you need to buy this in instrument to learn music, eventually you will need to find some uh, other way to, uh, to be able to get that thing and that could be addressed by the prosperity coupons. So, and this is a, 
the extract from the agenda where the mother said about this idea. And she said, they are exasperated by the way things are. They say no more personal property. But as they don't have so much imagination, they haven't found the way yet. And then Satpam suggested a system of coupons. And the mother said, yes, of course, that's very good. That would be a whole organization to be worked out. We need something like that in Auroville, based on an activity. That work could be defined as an activity with a collective usefulness, not a selfish one. So now to achieve this idea and replace money by a system of coupons, we did a little study that we would like to present you now. So here are a few simple things about systems of exchange. How and why they appeared in the history of mankind more than 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia at about the same time than writing and what they are traditionally used for. So everybody knows what is bartering. This is the most common, fair and uh, easy way to exchange things. Two people have two things to exchange and it happens just that these two people need what the others has. But this, of course, is a very inefficient medium of exchange. And it cannot really be used in a collectivity or society like the one in Auroville. So this is the origin of bartering tokens. In Mesopotamia, as I said, five times more, in fact, up to 9,000 years ago, they started to use clay tablets to be able to exchange and keep track of uh, exchanges between the community. So these butter tokens were symbols of a debt due by someone to someone else or eventually to the community. So how did it work? So that was very simple. When two people had to exchange something, for instance, they would create a clay tablet where they would imprint with cuneiforms the modalities of their bargain. Then they would break this tablet into two. Each one would get one part of it. And when the exchange would be finished, they would reassemble the two tablets and throw it out, which means that the barter token was created only when exchange was occurring. It was not like money, where you create a certain amount of money and then you distribute it within the community. And what happens is most of the time, some have more than others, and in the end, there is not enough. So in this system, it's not like this. So the simplicity and fairness of this very ancient medium of exchange can now be refined and complexified with modern technologies with the use of the internet, computers, and cell phones. It can involve a whole community instead of only two or few people. This is what inspired us in the conception of the prosperity coupon as a symbol replacing these old barter tokens. This and a few sentences from Sri Aurobindo's essay on self-determination, where he said that life is self-fulfillment which moves upon a ground of mutuality. It involves a mutual use of one by the other and in the end of all by all, ideally done by a higher law of our being, which shall discover a means of reconciliation, free reciprocity, and unity. So how does it work? So the very first thing is, let's imagine that these old clay tablets are now replaced with our prosperity coupons. And let's imagine that a coupon is and will always be worth one kilo of sea salt. Why sea salt? Because sea salt is, everybody knows it, everybody is using it, it's simple, and it's available in an almost infinite uh, quantity in the sea. So there is unlike, not likely to be a, a lot of fluctuation in the price of sea salt. So now, if one kilo of sea salt is worth 20 rupees, you can evaluate the number of coupons a service or any good will be worth. The value in rupee of a kilo of sea salt may increase with inflation, but a coupon will always be worth a kilo of sea salt. So it's stable, which means that a service will always be a certain number of coupons, whatever the price of salt is uh, in the rupee market. Now, the prosperity coupon, the spirit would be a community of contributors. In any ecosystem, like in a forest, for instance, where you have all kinds of plants, mushrooms, and so on, you have a community of contributors, which means that 
When one takes something, one needs to contribute something. So that there is really always an exchange. And this is how uh, ecosystems are working. In ecosystems, like a forest, you don't need much from outside. Everything just provides what is needed uh, at the right moment. We are all now accustomed with uh, our financial service accounts that we are using with rupees. And in fact, it would be working a little bit the same way, but the difference would be that instead of calculating uh, things in rupees, it will be done with prosperity coupons. So everybody would get a prosperity coupon account, but everybody would start at zero. So there is nobody who has more than any, anybody. And the difference with the current account would be that with this account, you can go in credit, in plus, but also in debit, in minus, up to a certain ceiling. We'll show you an example of uh, exchange between these four people. And for the simplicity of the presentation, we just do it with a transaction which have all the same value, let's say four coupons. So imagine that Shanti gives some milk to Otto. Otto will credit Shanti's with four coupons, and by crediting her account with four coupons, he will get minus four coupons. The same thing will happen between Cathy and Eric. Uh, Eric will credit Cathy's account with four coupons, and then he will get minus four accounts. Then when Otto gives the service to Cathy, then what is happening is that their two accounts come back to zero. And finally, all the accounts are coming back to zero when uh, Eric provides the service to Shanti. So the sum of all the accounts is always zero. It's a zero concept, which means something very important is that the amount of coupons which are circulating can flexibly vary according to the needs. And we'll see why it's important later on. <clears throat> then, of course, we need to put some ceilings. Otherwise, some people will uh, use credits and credits and credits and will never participate. So in this, you, you can fix some limits. And the limits depends on what each individual service or unit is ready to contribute to the community. So for instance, if somebody who is working full time and want to use this uh, coupon full time, he could have a credit up to, let's say, one to three months of turnover or maintenance. But if somebody wants to contribute only a few hours per month, that will be much less. Now, what is happening when somebody reaches minus ceiling but what is happening is that this person cannot use the, the, this coupon system anymore. So that person needs to contribute again before it, that person can use these coupons again. Now, what is happening when somebody reaches credit ceiling in plus, then all the coupons which are above, all these coupons will go back to the community so that the community can use it. And it makes the token circulate and be shared. So that's one of the main points, that this token or this coupon should always be circulating within the community. And now, as I said earlier, if you want to go above, there is always a possibility by using a piggy bank which is linked to your account. If you decide, for instance, to buy a guitar and that you cannot buy within this credit, you can just set a piggy bank for this and imagine that this guitar is 2,000 coupons, you will just say, okay, I want to set a piggy bank for 2,000 coupons. And then, month by month, we will add more coupons within this piggy bank. Now, the interesting thing is that these coupons will be frozen. You cannot use them. They will be used by the community for investments so that there is no tetherization in any kind unless uh, you really set it for something specific and then even before you fill the full uh, piggy bank, then the community can use it for investment like developing services and so on. So this first step is the most simple use of the prosperity coupon system. It could be started very soon just by creating the prosperity accounts and it would be used mainly for exchanges between Aurelians and newcomers. It's very easy to do. You just need to upgrade the, the software in the financial service, create this account, and then just start to use them. Now, if we want to imagine that the prosperity coupons could replace as much as possible the use of conventional currencies in Auroville, at least for all our daily usage, we would need to explore it further. 
So let's imagine that these coupons could be used not only by Aurelians, but also by services like Portus and Nandini, units, farms, guest houses, and guests. How would that be possible? So let's take the example of Portus. That's a very simple example. If you want to imagine that Portus uh, could be interested to use these coupons, then, of course, Portus should be able to use these coupons for purchasing or to give away for as a maintenance or prosperity for the people who are working there. So this kind of system can work only if you have some interest to use these coupons. And this means that we will need to create a whole network of exchange between all the individuals, services, unit, farms. And of course, this would take some time to organize, but this is how it would look like. So here we take the travel of a few coupons within Auroville, within our community. So imagine that we have two people, Sarasu and Hans. Sarasu gives away a kuja to Hans, and Hans will give to Sarasu 50 coupons. Then Sarasu can use the same coupons to go to Portus and get some food. Portus can use the same coupon to go to the farm and get some mangoes. The farm can get some seeds from the botanical garden. Botanical garden can give away these coupons to pay some worker. The worker could use this coupon to go to the Porto store for the workers, as I said earlier, so that they can be interested in using them also. The Porto store could use the same coupon to get some food, some tomatoes from a farm. The farm could change these 50 coupons against some rupees. The financial service can use the coupons to give away to a guest against 1,000 rupees. And again, the 50 coupons can be used by the guest to get some service by hands. Now the loop is over, and at the end, the, these 50 coupons that just disappear, they come back to zero. So it's a very, uh, as you will see, it's a very uh, flexible and democratic way to organize uh, exchanges because uh, everybody can create, in fact, prosperity coupons. It's not one authority which will create, it is each one of us. So we could also study all the other cases, how it would work for a unit, a service, a guest house, student, workers, and guests, and eventually also the visitor center. But that would be too tedious now, and that will be part of another uh, presentation specifically on this subject. So now, this is also only one form of coupons. We could have different kind of coupons. We could have gift coupons. We could have guest coupons. We could have all kinds of coupons. That it's up to us to imagine how we can make it evolve and adapt it to our needs. And beyond this, that's the seventh point, we would be able to create a prosperity cooperative network, which means that, of course, if our main is to achieve self-sufficiency for most of the things we consume in Auroville, it is obvious that will never be possible for everything. It would therefore be advisable to create a prosperity coupon network with other foundations, organizations, producers, farms, and so on, which could provide what we need and to which we could provide in exchange Auroville high-quality products using the Auroville prosperity coupon networks. So, Let's imagine that this is Auroville. At the center, we have the financial service and prosperity. You have the, all the different uh, Aurovillian and uh, services and units, and then everybody can exchange with these coupons within Auroville community. But if we want to go beyond, then we could connect with the Frero Mindo Ashram, with some poultry farm, organic cotton farm, uh, organic India, organic farms, and so on, so that we can exchange with them. And they could also exchange between themselves. But, something very important, all these outsiders would, would be invited only by Auroville, so that it remains an Auroville experience, and it doesn't spread beyond. So, the very first question we should ask ourselves, why to go for such a thing? Not only because the mother said that we, of course, she said that we should replace the exchange of money with uh, Auroville prosperity and coupons, but also because when we, if you study a little bit what is actually the conventional currencies, you will see that conventional currencies like dollar, euro, are first of all, they are scarce. There is not enough money for all the needs, and some people, of course, accumulate a lot more than others. So it's unfair, of course, for all those who cannot compete. 
It is also unstable as they constantly lose their value due to inflation, speculation, and usury. A banknote of 100 rupees today will not be worth 100 rupees after six months. It will be less. And after one year, even less. So each time you lose the value of the money you get. Now, the problem is that this instability can eventually lead to gigantic collapse of the world economy, as we have already seen in 1929, in 2008, and right now, in a scale that we don't know. So, last point, which is not well known, and it, which is very important for all the people who are concerned by the environment, is that these currencies are destructive to our society and environment, as a scarcity implies a constant search for material growth to avoid a complete collapse. We all know that when you listen to the news and you listen to politicians, they always speak about the need for growth, and growth, and growth, which is a complete absurdity in a finite world. We cannot grow always the production and consumption. There are some limits to this. And unfortunately, the design, the way these currencies have been designed in the last two or three hundred years are leading us to the destruction of the planet. To hope to solve the environmental issues without solving the money issue, some specialists just say that it's a chimera. Now, what are the advantages of the prosperity coupons? On the other hand, the prosperity coupons will be fair and as abundant as the need just because anyone can actually create the coupons while doing exchanges. It will be stable since a coupon will always be worth a kilo of sea salt. And it will take a better care of our society and environment as they will encourage local production and consumption and bring about a self-supporting society which will move upon a ground of mutuality. There would be no speculation, no interest, no inflation, and eventually it could lead to prosperity for all. Prosperity, of course, means abundance. In, and not only in a material way, in you know, all the way, spiritual, psych psychological, uh, and so on. Now, if all this is achieved, finally it will end up in the creation of a self-supporting circular economy. I don't know if you have already heard about circular economy, but the circular economy is an economy where most of the things which are consumed are produced in the region, the bioregion, or on, on the spot. And also, it's an economy which uh, is aiming at producing no waste. And if wastes are produced, they should be recycled. The aim of such an economy is to reduce pollution, waste, energy, and the use of natural resources to its minimum. So in other words, in a way, we need to close the loop so that there is as little leak as possible and as little import as possible. Now, as we, we have seen, uh, this study concluded that finally, if we want to tackle the issue of economy, we can just address it by combining several kind of economies. The first one would be Oroville Prosperity, and then we would have the Prosperity Coupons, and also the Gift Economy, and other means could be invented later. And then this would mean that in Auroville, as nothing is compulsory, we would end up with four major circles of our economy. So at the center, you would have prosperity for all those who would be uh, participating and who would uh, use the in-kind economy. Then you would have the intermediate circle <coughs> for the people who would like to continue as today with the exchange of money. Then the visitors' economy and finally the bioregion. The with our, uh, with the villages around, and uh, also with farmers and uh, and others. So, the prosperity circle would be for those who wish to live according to the mother's vision, with no circulation of money, and they would have Auroville prosperity and access to Portus PTDC and services at cost price. Then the intermediate circle would be for those who want to stay in the present system and they would have access also to Portus at cost price and access at Portus store. The visitor circle would have access to the Portus and prosperity coupons with a 10% extra 
as contribution to Orville. Today, all the visitors, guests, they are paying 150 rupees per day to the community as a contribution, which we find a little unfair because for those who don't have much money, it's quite a lot, and those who are quite wealthy, it's very little. So instead of this, we could just address it through the prosperity coupon so that the contribution depends on how much people are spending in Auroville. And finally, buy your region circle for people from our surrounding area, and they would have access to the Porto store for the workers with the prosperity coupons. So now, the last point, quite important, if we really wish to achieve all these steps towards your dream, it becomes obvious that we need to have a proper decision-making process to be able to organize such an adventure. And again, we can only get our inspiration from your vision. So that's the last point, the creation of a unity council, which would be a bridge between the residents assembly and the working groups. So of course, there are many people who would say, why to create one more group when we have so many? That would be really silly. But in fact, we have all the groups, except the very groups that the mother envisioned. So that may be why it's not working so well. And uh, the mother, when she spoke about the organization of Auroville, she spoke about a group of people, four, seven, or eight, a small number having an intuitive intelligence. Intuitive being more important than intelligence. And then she said that these people should be convinced that the highest consciousness is the best judge of the most material things. They should be organizers, and she said to be organizer is not to govern, it's to organize. Okay, and the condition to be an organizer should be this, no more desires, no more preferences, no more attractions, no more repulsion, and a perfect equality for all things. Sincerity, of course, but that goes without saying. Now, at present, all human organizations are based on the visible fact, which is a falsehood, public opinion, which is another falsehood, and a moral sense, which is a third falsehood, and the mother loves. And this is interesting, because now, how do we take decision in Auroville? We just go for voting. The voting is a problem, because voting, it's always divisive. It's the authority of a majority against a minority, even if the minority is spiritually right. So it's an imposition which can be felt very unfair. And on top of this, it is divisive. So in a place where we are supposed to be at the service of truth and looking for unity, it just doesn't make sense. So today we can only see that a great confusion governs our society. More and more we can see a lack of trust towards our working groups and also a lack of transparency, coordination and communication, and last but not least, a lack of practical vision. So in order to change our organization, we would need an efficient decision-making process, and this could be addressed through a Unity Council inspired by your suggestion. The Unity Council, in fact, was an idea by Shri Kiri Joshi when he was here, chairman of the governing board. He was really involved in the community when he was here, and he, he spoke with us quite at length about the organization. And he finally concluded that something was missing in our organization, and that was this Unity Council, which would be inspired by the Mother's Vision. So how would that work? So let's imagine that this is a residence assembly. You have the white spots, which are the Orvillians. Then you have the working groups. And then at the center, you would have the Unity Council, which would eventually link everything. Now, how would it be constituted? The Unity Council would be constituted of two kinds of members. The first member would be kind of permanent members. Let's say four to seven members chosen for their intuitive mind, organization skill, truthfulness, and spirit of unity. They should live in Auroville for at least 20 years and be involved in the community life. By themselves, they will not have any power to take any decision, but will be part of the decision-making process for each subject explored along with the temporary members. The temporary members would be any members of the residence assembly who wishes to join on a particular issue. Let's say that 
Unity Council decide to tackle the issue of water, then the Unity Council will make an appeal within the community and all the people who are interested, who have uh, a knowledge and experience about the, this particular problem could join the Unity Council and be part of the Unity Council for this particular subject. So, but this, of course, this temporary member should have some valuable knowledge or skill to offer and commit to follow the process on a regular basis and work for unity. Now, the decisions would be taken only by the complete council. So this is important because it's not a vertical organization, it's not an horizontal organization, it's both. We have the possibility with this to involve anybody at any point from the community on a particular subject. But at one point, we need to be able not only to take decisions, because otherwise problems are just getting worse and worse, and uh, also to see that they are implemented. So a decision would be taken only by the complete council, permanent members and temporary members, so that anybody in the community can be involved on a specific subject, provided he or she follows the criteria we just mentioned. So no major decision concerning any aspect of our collective life. And this is very important. The Unity Council is not a new firefighter council or group that really to tackle main issues which are concerning everybody, like education, economy, development of the city, and so on. <coughs> so no major decision concerning any aspect of our collective life would be taken by any group without prior consultation with the Unity Council. Unity Council would work in a spirit of peace, unity and harmony and listen to all the points of view before taking any action. Unity Council has for mandate to explore all the pending and divisive issues for the sake of unity and harmony. We are having so many issues which have been pending for years, like entry, uh, city, uh, economy, and so on. I, we believe that maybe it's time to look at them, make uh, serious research, and try to find some, not only some, uh, take some decision, but eventually to be able to present some plan, practical plan of action, at least for short, medium, and long term. So, and then the Unity Council will have to propose a coherent practical and convincing vision about how to fulfill your dream in our collective life. So, before any major problem is explored, an appeal is made within the community to ask for any positive input and ask temporary members to volunteer to help solving this particular issue. Decisions would be presented and explained in detail to the residents' assembly for feedbacks and in case of substantial negative feedback, the Unity Council see how to include these feedbacks and adapt their decision. The final decision is presented and explained in detail. The Unity Council sees that the decision is properly implemented, and this should lead to an active residence assembly. I'd like to make a comment uh, about this. Uh, when Kirijoshi was here, he repeatedly said that the residence assembly is not a decision-making body. It is a research body. And uh, that's how eventually the residence assembly could be really becoming a research body. We have so many things to explore, so many problems to solve, that eventually we could involve not everybody, but at least whoever wants to be involved to tackle these issues. So the role of the permanent members would be to assure coordination and continuity something which is very much lacking today. There are, we have many groups, but we don't communicate between themselves and take decisions without knowing uh, the uh, interest of others. To make sure that we are working in a spirit of unity and harmony, to interact and communicate with the residents' assembly, to organize researchers on specific problems, to collect facts and points of view, to study and synthesize data and our point of view, and aspire for intuitive answers to see that the spirit of our will is respected in our collective life, which is maybe the most important. And then the role of the temporary members would be to contribute by their knowledge and experience, to help at solving specific collective issues, to interact and communicate with the residents' assembly. So now we are coming to the conclusion. This is the end of the presentation. 
And uh, we would like to state that this proposal for a change in our collective life is an attempt to envision how Roville could be organized in a different, truer, and more fraternal way, and to try to embody as much as possible your vision. As we have seen, it would be a combination of various forms of economics. Prosperity will give all the bodily needs in kind. Freestore would develop the gift economy. The Aura platform and the Prosperity Coupon Network would complement these two forms of economics to offer more possibilities. We didn't talk about the Aura platform because it's not our subject, but what the work which has been done so far and which is still going on is very valuable. And uh, it could work along with uh, Prosperity Coupon as two kind of complementary uh, way to exchange within the community. So, but by no means does it present all what we have said, does it present to be the final word about how Roville could evolve and be organized. It just lays out some practical steps to move in the direction of a more familiar way to live together, if only we wish to shift from the present status quo. It is a work in progress, nothing is fixed, as you said, and it is the expression of our collective aspiration for a true change. Things will obviously evolve as we experiment. Of course, to some of us, it will seem to be an impossible attempt. But as we have already seen in our past history, when we decide as a community to do something together, we have seen this with the construction of the matrimonial, we can do anything, and what seems to be an impossibility becomes a children's game. Just as if your help was always present, when we were ready to do your divine work and fulfill your dream of a better world. So we can only pray now that you guide us and give us the true inspiration and the faith and determination to leap into the future. May your dream become true. May your will become what she was meant to be. The city as a service of truth. The city the earth needs. And then we will end up with this slide. And uh, thank you very much for your kind attention for this long and tedious presentation. <laughs> Uh, one thing I would like to mention before we go for discussion is that, uh, first of all, uh, we, I, will, I will send this presentation to all of you so that you can go through it uh, at home because it's quite dense. And also because after this, there is a very interesting part which is relevant quotes from Shreomindo and Zobazer, which was a true inspiration for this work. You will see that they are extremely interesting and inspiring. They belong to the future if we want to look at the future. So. Let's go back to this, and now we can have a session of discussion, interaction, critics, and so on, if you have some idea, and if you want to share anything. I would like you, I will re request you to speak in the mic, because this session has been recorded. So. I just want to know, like, we're talking about Oroville, but in the end you said, like, it will also work in the bioregion. But how would um, the coupon work in bioregion? The coupon can work in different ways in the bioregion. The first uh, thing which could be helpful would be to give away some coupons to workers in exchange of the possibility for them to purchase some, let's say, some good vegetable organic food at a cheap rate. It would be also possible to, to use them with organic farmers. We know that uh, now Ramanan has done uh, quite a big work uh, to to create a network with organic farmers all around. And we could also exchange with these farmers uh, with these coupons. That could be one way. So it's a no network to, to create. And that it's some, not something you can do in, uh, in a few, uh, I know, I know, few weeks like or months. It's, it's really, it will take a few years. But this kind of um, uh, modality of exchange uh, is based on what we call Mutual credit clearing system, it already exists in the world, it's used, it works. And uh, of course for this, we need to have the participation of many people. It doesn't work only for uh, 50 or 100, it really needs a whole community and eventually it would really be very interesting if the bioregion could uh, respond to this. Even bioregion, we can also include uh, people from Pondicherry or a bit further away. Not, not much uh, more than Pondicherry, but 
the ashram people, for instance, Sri Aurobindo Ashram, could be very well interested in this. Yeah, um, in Findon, in um, um, Scotland, you heard about the Findon, right? It's in the village. Like there, they have their own currency. So like this currency has the same value as a pound. Uh, I think it's, it's maybe like a penny or a, a, a 10 cent, maybe it's less than the value, but like it's been used in, in throughout the country. So it has the same value and it has, uh, but it's, it's a Findon money. It's another way to, to do it. We prefer this, first of all, because uh, alternative currencies and cryptocurrency are not allowed in India. So we have to find another way to do exchange, and this is much more like complex bartering. So that's why we, we, go, we, we went for that. And what I personally like is that this is a zero concept where you don't create a currency. It's everybody who can create the coupons at any point. So that's very interesting. And also it refers to very ancient, the most, in fact, the most ancient community of exchange, which was the clay tablet. And usually when you go back to the origin of things, you find the essence of the thing. And that's what uh, appealed us, what's happening for us. Thanks. Orville has a currency, no? No, not yet. There is an aura which has been created, yeah, uh, which is not really a currency. It's, uh, it's a different system, and uh, we have been uh, in touch with uh, Aura people, particularly Dundee, and uh, uh, I had a, quite a long discussion with her because uh, I personally don't, uh, there are some features of the Aura which I found uh, limitative. And, but at the same time, it's very good because they are creating a platform where anybody can join and just propose any kind of service. So if you want to, change, to join the Aura platform and you want to offer some cooking class, for instance, you can just put this. Now, this, as it, it has been designed, would not be able to replace fully or, or mainly the exchange of money within Auroville. First, because it has no fi fixed value. Secondly, because every day you get a certain amount of aura, and thirdly, because the guest would not be able to use it. So in our discussion, finally, uh, with uh, Dan B, we, we uh, found out that these two ways could be complementary. So that we could have the aura platform in one way, and then the prosperity coupon. And eventually, prosperity coupon could be also addressed through the, the aura platform. But this needs to be explored further. And also in the future, could it, could it help uh, creating more jobs in the sense that sometimes a lot of jobs, like in services, they cannot hire people because they don't have the funds. Could that actually help having a mean to actually pay at least in kind? So it would help to, yeah. This is the idea, is to, to, uh, to go beyond because now we are having a certain amount of uh, rupees, which is really limited, li limited and uh, it's, it's running away with the crisis. So we don't know what we, after six months, where we will be. Maybe uh, the financial service will not be able to, uh, to pay maintenances. With a system like this, we can continue to function. Uh, and, and as I said, uh, since we can create as much as we need, uh, if you create a service, eventually you could this in, 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 in minus if you are, of course, ready to contribute something to the community. That's, uh, that, that is possible. And also, uh, also for uh, I mean to develop uh, many many other uh, uh, maybe farms or other things really to link. It's uh, I I just spoke with uh, Kal Song uh, when she came uh, for the presentation and she told me, but this is how we were uh, functioning in Tibet. Uh, and I mean that's not it's a very fair and simple way to to exchange and to participate in a collectivity. So that uh, uh, there is always a flow of energy because what is currency? It's energy. And this energy needs to flow to be able to create. And that's the point. Yeah, I, I didn't fully understand the bridge between the Unity Council and the uh, coupons. So could you... Oh, a bridge between the... Uh, there is no link. <laughs> There's no, no link. I mean, the coupon is, deals with the economy and the, the, the way we can exchange between ourselves and create services, create units, and create whatever. Of course, we will not be able to use coupons to build, uh, uh, to build the city. That's out of question because we will always need to purchase uh, things from outside, like cement, uh, steel, and so on. 
But for our internal economy, yes, for most of the things, for our daily life, we could use mostly this. Now, the Unity, Unity Council deals mostly with decision-making process. How do we take decision in Auroville? It, today, it's very confused. There is no, no real way to explore and deal with uh, the, our main issues. That way, we have seen that the entry uh, problem or the housing problem is, is lasting for years and years and years, and after years, it's not yet solved. So that's how we saw that maybe this, is, this would be a way to concentrate the research and energy in one place so that everybody could link, not only the Europeans, but also the working groups. So let's imagine that we want to deal with the housing problem at, at last, uh, to try to, not necessarily to solve it, but to find a proper way to address it. Then we would just ask to the community, not only the housing group to join, but also L'Avenir and the Entry, that's the three main uh, groups which, are, uh, uh, which have to deal with this. Because mostly it's, uh, it's for the people who are coming which need to find uh, housing. And uh, so that would be the, the thing. And then Orvians or other people could join and then we would have a real research about it and a debate and see how we can planify the development of uh, housing uh, in the short, medium, and long term. Okay, so the economy through the coupons is one aspect which would be yes. discussed in, among so many others, amongst all the others. Okay, so yes. that would be, okay, the link. Yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, prosperity coupons don't need to be discussed. Uh, you just need to do it, and if people, people can use it or not use it, that's up to everybody. But uh, uh, it's, it's not linked, you know. Uh, it's like uh, Orville Prosperity, we don't need to go through the Orville Council mm. uh, to be able to, to just to decide to do it. We just do it and when people are ready to join, they can join. So that's the idea, not to uh, make anything compulsory, just to open uh, a new space where people who want to live in a different way can live in a different way. Oh, and all the units being... Um you said, uh, I think, not all the units, but all the um, uh, goods units will be under Portus. And uh, will that lead to reorganization of the, um, the space, like more bulk, uh, yes. less packaged? Uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, that, that is the idea, to have a, a more conscious way of uh, dealing with consumption. And, and uh, for this, uh, of course, we, we need just to, to, to see, it. I mean, to, at, at least to set some criteria. Why should we uh, sell some unhealthy food or some uh, food uh, packaging which is very polluting? Why should we go for that? No, we can choose and just see that what we are uh, purchasing and, and, and giving to the, to the Aurelian are uh, following these criteria. And also, most important is that the prices are really at cost price. Cost price is not what you get in Pondy, but it includes the transport and, and a few things. But it's really the minimum possible price for each and every Eurovidian. So that, because Eurovidians are getting very little in terms of maintenance, most of them. And uh, why should we pay more than what is needed? Uh, one more. Just a doubt. Why did you, f I mean, it's about the Unity Council. Uh, why did you fix that 20 years that we have to be in Oroville? Again. Can you explain it? Because uh, uh, it's really confusing. Uh, yes, again. I, I, maybe I will explain it a bit more. For example, there are some Orovillians who came from abroad and then they spent their like whole life here, who spent more than 20 years. And there is kids who born and brought up who is tw more than 20 now. And we born in Bay region and became an Orovillian and more than 20 now. So. That Why is that? Uh, that's, I mean, once again, this is a detail. That's mm -hmm. uh, some criteria. All this can evolve and we will see. We said this, why? Because we have seen that there are things, I mean, unless you have spent quite a lot of years in Auroville that you don't really understand. And to deal with major issues, uh, like what we were talking about, education and so on, uh, that would be better if people are here for a long time. But that, it's not the only criteria, there are others. And maybe, maybe we'll change this criteria, I don't know. Frankly, this is a, this is, a, but we need to have criteria, mm. that's for sure, because otherwise, you know, it's not a matter of uh, bringing together opinions. 
opinions have no value in themselves. We need to have solid researches, solid answers, and find uh, really uh, meaningful uh, solutions. Yeah, I mean, it, it was really helpful for me because when you mentioned that 20 years and then the qualities you mentioned, it doesn't mean if, if I didn't spend 20 years here that I don't, the quality, I mean, the, no? It doesn't mean that I don't have that quality. We didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't say that. The most important, I think, for the mother, she said that people should be organizers. She should know how to organize. And she, she gave the, what, what it means to be organizer. There are not so many people who know how to organize. If you look, uh, around you, I'm, I don't know if we have 200 or 300 real organizers in Auroville, I'm not sure. It's possible, uh, but I, I, I doubt. And then there are other criteria, well. I don't know, but we need to find a way to, to select these people so that they really work for unity. And that's the main point, for unity and peace and harmony. That's the main point. That's what should be always at the center of the table, so that there is no betrayal of our uh, aim as it happens quite often, not necessarily consciously, but uh, there are things which, uh, for instance, I will just give you an example. The mother has said, no rules in Auroville. As long as there, is no, there are no rules, there is some hope. But now we have tons of rules. Why that? And why did she say that, no rules? Because in life there is an infinite diversity of things and you cannot put things in a box. You have to deal with each case uh, case per case, you know, each problem, each individual is unique. So if you want to put things, I mean, to organize life with rules, it's like you make a big mechanic, which becomes a jail, and then finally everybody is suffocating as it is today. So that's the thing, and she said also, if we need to make any rules, they should be as vast and flexible as possible. So vast, we don't go into the details. We, we just say, well, yes, in Auroville, our aim are peace, open earth, and unity. So everything which is violent, which brings disunity, disharmony, is not welcome. That's for sure. So you don't need to make tons of rules. Otherwise, we end up with, with hundreds of pages. Nobody reads them, nobody understands them. And then it's confusion because we don't know how to act. And we kill the creativity, we kill the society with these things. She spoke about divine anarchy. In divine anarchy, there are no rules. But to have divine anarchy, we need to be divine. That's not yet the case. So that's the thing. We, we, we are in between, and we need to find a way which is, doesn't uh, put, them, put, put ourselves in jails. And yet, we need to be able to, to control a little bit so that there is no uh, betrayal, major betrayal of, of the, the dream and the charter. So that's the thing. So that was just an example. Thank you. At the beginning, you spoke of, about the form. I think for me, it's a very interesting topic because if we want to share prosperity, we have to create prosperity. And we have to see about the form. Because when the lockdown comes, I, I think one of the most evident things to do it was going to the farm to work. Because I thought from Pondy the goods were not coming for a moment, so it was an instinctive way for me to go. And what I can start is farm has a really bad condition because they don't invest, they don't have money to invest, the windmills are bad conditions, they have to be renewed, they have to put some solar panel to pump the water, they have no money to, go to buy the good seeds. So, what you say about Orosha, which is cultivating just a very small amount of the earth, for me it's very significant of the lack of that. So is there a group which is uh, actually making some audit or some research about what about this farm uh, issue to do? Because Moses says also the farm have, have to feed Orovillian. It is very important to be sustainable and to have not to depend on the outside, the bioregion or something. So for me, it's you know, when you build a house, you build first the ground. So for me, for this uh, uh, prosperity system of coupon, we need to have a very firm first floor. And this first first floor is a farm and also Portus, but what I say about Portus, it's actually, it is not working for everywhere, for everyone. So what's the problem about that? Because I think it is a very fantastic idea. It's one of the most fantastic ideas in Auroville. But it's actually not 
able to everyone to go there. So what is this, what, are you in way of that? And is there any solution coming? There, there are uh, solutions coming, and there are uh, some groups which are already working on this. I spoke about Ramadan, but there are others. And uh, what you say is very important because prosperity in Norway can work only if we have food security. And this food security should be our main uh, source of income and wealth. We don't know what the, the world will be made of in six months. That's really uh, completely unknown to anybody today. So we need to explore this possibility. And the possibility is here if we have the will, because two figures I'm going to give you. Today, we purchase more than 85% of what we consume from outside. So it's a huge leak in our economy. And each time you leak, then you have to get the money from outside. So that's. Uh, it creates a lot of uh, uh, tension. And the second thing is that the investment in farms is less than 15% in our overall budget. So let's imagine that suddenly we increase this budget by uh, up to 30 or 35%, then we can change the thing. And when it's really a matter of uh, dealing with what we are going to eat tomorrow or within a few months, then maybe that's meaningful just to decide collectively that this is our top priority with water. Water security and food security is really what we need to achieve today. That's our uh, feeling. And uh, with this, then we can develop all the, what we have seen, the prosperity coupon and so on. That makes sense only if we can do this. If we cannot do, uh, achieve this security, then, I mean, we are drifting away. We, I don't know where we are going, but uh, that's really, uh, and this is what is very important. It's, it would be a very good way to, uh, reconnect together and work together uh, for the community but also for with the villages and, and to build a different kind of uh, relationship with uh, our s surrounding area based on something which is very material it's very good to speak about unity and so on but at one point on a material level we need to show that we we can do more than just speak and speak Yes, please. I give you back. Uh, hi, it was really nice, uh, the fact that uh, you can get out of money and thus uh, the scarcity of money no more becomes a problem. But it really works in case of a circular economy. Yeah, does it also suggest that uh, I will be kind of split in between two, participating in two different kind of economies, uh, which might be, uh, I'm not used to that because I'm only used to kind of a rupee economy and I briefly experienced it for 15 days when I was traveling in Europe. So some of you might be used to like dealing in two different kind of economies. Uh, and, and as well a third one. So what does it mean? So that means I participate in this coupon economy and also I participate uh, another uh, kind of life with money economy and how, what is the negotiation between that? That is one question. And the second question is uh, your coupons are based on one kilo of salt and it is the market price of the salt is going to decide that. And thus we can kind of uh, calculate the cost of each and every other product which has a specific uh, money attached to it, which we buy from the market. Then how do we value the, the, the contribution to the community? Like how do you value the, the uh, massage or how do you value other acts and how do you uh, value things of intellectual property and a labor that one puts in the farm? But particularly that, you know, the farm labor you know, it is a, historically we have seen it that a, a, a one a developing of a software or a graphic design vis-a-vis -vis a growing of one kilo of, of any particular vegetable, uh, its replicability and, and marketability, there are economic issues. And how do we bring, say that uh, in spite of whatever we are doing within this community, the fact that what I produce is can be replicated and sold in multiple copies or for that matter copyrights so we have to address issues of copyrights and, and duplicability, which will not apply for a vast majority of workers uh, who are our people. You know, in, in another system, in otherwise what is happening is that wage labor is usually 
uh, relegated to a different country or a different kind of people, which is a crisis which Europe is facing, that you don't have work. You know, all the work is being done by Indians or Koreans. And it is a, it is a problem that we are also facing today. It has come down to our footsteps uh, today. So how do we address that? Because we have to value our produce and work, and in a very equitable way. And that is a very critical question. Yeah, so to answer to, to this, the first question was, uh, uh, is it possible to deal with both, I mean, the prosperity coupon and also the rupee uh, 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 economy? Of course it's possible, because there will be always the possibility to exchange with outside of, of Auroville. That will be even uh, necessary. Uh, so it's not, uh, how to say, both ca can be uh, uh, working together. Uh, within Auroville, uh, people who don't need to, uh, to deal with outside, they can use only the prosperity coupon. Now, how to value? If we say that, uh, let's imagine that today one kg of sea salt is 20 rupees, and it's very easy to, uh, to uh, value uh, service. If your service now is, you imagine that it's 200 rupees per hour, then it's 10 coupons. That's to start with, but in the end, in the end, you just don't think about rupees anymore because it's not 20 uh, coupons, it's 20 kilo of sea salt. And we should, at one point, we should disconnect our mind with the rupee value. So at the, at the beginning, you have to do it, and that's a good way just to value anything, but that's all. Now about copyrights. If you talk about copyrights you know, within Auroville, I have to doubt because in Auroville, uh, there is no property, so no copyright. Without Auroville, then you can deal with this, with rupees or whatever. If you sell some, uh, some film outside, then uh, if you sell it to the Amer in America, you can get some copyright in uh, dollar or whatever. And yeah? I, um, I think a lot of the concepts which you're presenting, I mean, it's, it's beautiful, but it also requires a, a shift of consciousness. And um, I mean, I think there's a lot of people which are ready to do that in our community. And there's also a number which wouldn't know how to proceed in that way because this, this all shows also if this was to be implemented, the community would go through a huge spiritual growth as well. And it would enhance a lot of the qualities which we are looking for in Oroville. The, there's the human factor which is the most unpredictable one, I think, in, in the middle? Um, it's a very good question, I think. And uh, um, you see, we started PTDC with, I think, 150 people, 200 people. And that was really an, a new experiment in Auroville. And now we are, I think, more than 1,500. So the idea is to start with a small number of people who really want to change, first of all. And we really want to work and do it. And then slowly, slowly, it can just spread. You know, uh, the, the, the psychological aspect is extremely important, but it, the psychological as, aspect, aspect also depends a lot on the environment. I mean, if our environment is unstable, if we are, we are scared, we have fear, if uh, we don't know what will be uh, tomorrow will be made of, then we'll have a society which will be uh, uh, quite an LC, I would say. Let's, so the idea is let's change, let's reorganize ourselves in a more fraternal, fraternal way and familiar way so that people feel secure. They feel related to each other. They feel that they are taken care of by the, com uh, the community. Then the psychology will change, I'm sure. That's for sure. And even beyond this, I mean, about the spiritual aspect, we don't know. But the mother and we know are very clear. The inner change and the outer change needs to go along together. They need to be addressed at the same time. Um, and um, about the unity, uh, what, what was it called? Unity Council, Committee? Yeah, Council. Council, yes. Well, that's, that's a beautiful thing, but it would be not so easy perhaps to, to select the people which would be on that council according I think the intuitive intelligence that was talked, I think, is very important because that brings something extra to the table, which is not necessarily something personal. Yeah. And I think that would definitely change Oroville in a... There was an idea just to, to start with the Unity Council as an experiment for six months, and we would deal with two major problems, the water and the food, which are not political. 
So already we brought aside the political aspect of it because that could really mess it up very well. We don't want to have a new super FAMC, which takes the decision for everybody. That's not the point. We want to have a way to take conscious and meaningful decision about important matters which concern everybody in the community and to really be able to find solution and eventually urgently if needed. So these two major aspects, food and water, could uh, uh, bring together the people who really can do and know about it. And then to propose to the community some really uh, meaningful plan for the, let's say, next six months, five years, ten years, and so that we can really see that we can move forward. That's the idea. And then if it works, then we'll see. Yeah, last question, maybe, or even. Unless somebody else wants it. Um, so first off, just good work with all of this because it's, a, it's quite in-depth and there's quite a lot of thought that's gone into it, so thank you. I was very much interested by the aspect, and it comes to what you were speaking of, um, of the creation of wealth with the idea of the coupons. So okay, the prosperity from what I've understood, correct me if I'm wrong, the prosperity scheme, let's say, itself would cover the basic needs, and we're looking at coupons for those little extra things. Yes. And, and, so uh, that is yeah. not the base. Those are for the little extras that sometimes we wish we had. Yeah. Voila. Yes? Okay. And what I found interesting is the possibility of creating wealth based on that, because as you start from zero, it means that we could consider, for example, if we wanted to put the question on the table, of kind of finding a bridge between the cognitive and uh, the physical labor, it could be a question put forward, say, to anybody who would join such a thing. Then, yes, it's a personal choice, perhaps. But we could still put the question forward to say, really, sitting a few hours, let's say, as an example, like you were saying, um, people who are coding, etc., or designing, in front of your computer or going in the field and hacking the ground, do you really think you should be able to, say, eat more than the person who is hacking at the ground? And maybe just putting those questions forward each time somebody would join the coupon aspect could raise questions for each of us that, we would, that would allow us to reevaluate not based on the rupee value of the service you are giving, but rather on the humanitarian value and coming back to what is each of us, what can each of us enjoy and share, if that makes sense. The other thing that came to mind when you spoke about the bioregion and starting with uh, employees who work within Orville, that they would be the first ones to kind of deal with these coupon, coupons, um, it could be a way of looking at and maybe balancing out the wage gap between men and women. Because imagine we say, okay, for anybody working in Orville, being paid a salary from any Orville service unit, etc., there is a part that is given in coupon. Now, to be seen how that balances out, but and imagine as a base, women will be given far more coupons than men, because men, regardless of the job that is done, get so much more money, and to to kind of uh, balance this, bridge this wage gap is very difficult because every year when you have to augment salaries, if you augment the women quite a lot to try to get them to catch up, the men get quite upset. And then I think each unit and service has faced such things. So it could be something that looks at bridging these things with uh, the coupons, which is a different approach. So I think your question was very valid of this because it could be questions that we ask ourselves and we could use this, the implementation of these little extras, but which for people of the bio region, from what I would understand, from what I've understood, they would be buying the basic needs. Yeah. They could, which means part of this could be covering whatever they need to purchase to cover their basic needs and to try to balance this gap out. I think it could be a really interesting aspect to explore. And the last aspect is um, the aspect of the gift economy that is very much present in Orville, in the sense there are people who are just ready to help at any point in time with anything. Uh, I need to fix the door of my house and I call Aditi and she might come and just help me out. Now, it wouldn't cross my mind to give her money for it unless I know she needs it, 
and maybe I don't have the money to give also because, but it could be a way this coupon system again, because we're creating wealth, the moment that she comes and does this, which she asks nothing for in return, there is no pricing for it, but that it could be a way of just saying, thank you by transferring, am I right? Part of my credit to her, yeah. right? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And also what you said uh, for the, I mean, the relationship with the uh, bioregion would be mostly for food uh, because it would not be possible to, uh, to build a food security only for Auroville. No. It needs to be for the, all of us, Auroville and the bioregion and that's where it would be really meaningful so that uh, the villagers can really get good food any time uh, of the year. And that's where we can really build uh, this, even this sense of family so that we share material things. Thank you. I just wanted to look at a few of these things and see if... Yeah. I think uh, maybe we'll one last question because uh, it's already late. Yeah. No. Yeah. Somebody who has not talked, if, if possible, yet. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Last question. Um, yeah, I'd also like to say thank you for the presentation. I can see a lot of work went into it. And um, yeah, so thanks for putting that together. There were some really inspiring ideas. Um, so what I was wondering, um, I've recently been kind of looking into you know old documents and old studies, and I've seen that there are there have been you know a lot of attempts to you know to approach the whole topic of prosperity and you know a lot of the ideals brought forth again and again. So I'm just wondering. Um, what can we learn from that? Because I can see that there have been attempts in the past, but they have been, yeah, some of them like PTDC have been very successful, but others have, have kind of faltered for some reason or the other. So I'm wondering what happened to those and how can, how can we learn from that to really bring forth um, these, yeah, these great ideas and take the next steps? At one point we just need to do it and uh we find that maybe uh, there is a kind of opportunity today with the crisis that uh, it's, it's really, uh, it becomes a need maybe to just to, to find other ways and uh, also to, uh, because in fact, you know, Auroville has, we, we had different kind of organizations who go all the years. Auroville started with Auroville Prosperity, it has worked for years, for years, from 1968, from the very beginning, up to the beginning of the uh, battle with the Shreomindo Society, because when the Shreomindo Society got involved in this battle, they just uh, stopped giving money. And since they were giving money for Auroville Prosperity, then Auroville Prosperity just disappeared. Now, it doesn't mean that it cannot uh, uh, come back. Of course it can, and especially now that we are in this crisis. So uh, what we can learn from this is that, yes, also, you see, for the last uh, five, six years, we had so many researchers. We started with the retreat, we had the open platform, we had uh, uh, also some um, research on the organization with a group for more than one, one year, and then the end is what? Is nothing. Nothing, because what we need to, to, to find is, at one point, we need to find, to start to act. And today, there are few things that we can really do right away. The first thing is, not only create uh, Auroville Prosperity uh, platform for those who want to, to join, but it's also we need to deal with Portus. And Portus, the, the aspiration Portus is just coming on the, on the table right now, and that may be where we will start yes, will the whole to, thing. I would like to continue. I think so she was not speaking about retreat or whatever, but more of uh, the concept of the Auroville Prosperity Project. Yeah. 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 No, it's not true. I'm sorry, I don't agree with you. Okay. It was because the people are not ready to jump. Could be both also. Okay. So, so. Could be both. both. No, it's, it, it's also like we've been building the infrastructures for all oral developments, you know, like the farms, the farms are full established now and like the farms are ready to produce and like um, is it, we are on the right path basically. Thanks for your good work.
So just a, a last word, uh, I will send you this, this presentation. One thing which is very important, that nothing is fixed in, in, in this presentation. It's just an overview how we could move forward. Things might change, we can add new ideas, we can change certain things. We are not attached to this particular form of exchange for the prosperity coupons. If you get a better one, we'll go for the better one. So it is, this is just an example of how we could move forward practically, and it's an inspiration and a call for inspiration. Thanks, you all.